and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Well, friends, a very warm welcome. It's lovely to be here. Can I add my welcome to that of Erin? Uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Wayne. Sarah and the family, it's lovely to have you here. And lovely to see uh, so many friends from Ludlow. Just bear in mind they're only here to make sure you've gone. Yeah. <laughs> so, a moment of silence and then we will pray and begin our act of worship together. Christ is head of the church. He alone is the source of all Christian ministry. Through the ages it is Christ who has called men and women to lives of service. By the Holy Spirit, all who believe and are baptised receive a ministry to proclaim Jesus as Saviour and Lord and to love and serve the people among whom they live and work. In Christ, we are to bring redemption, to reconcile and to make whole. After his resurrection and ascension, Christ gave gifts abundantly to the Church. Some he made apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip God's people for their work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. We are to be salt for the earth. We are to be light to the world. Today we welcome Wayne and his family to this benefice and license him at the beginning of his ministry among us. Together we dedicate ourselves to the service of God in this community and listen afresh to God's call to each one of us. <coughs> Bishop Richard, we present to you the Reverend Wayne Davies to be admitted as incumbent of this parish. Bishop Richard, we I confirm that, that the, the parish representatives have shared fully in the appointment process and, and that, that we consent to the institution of Reverend Wayne Davies. Wayne, do you believe that God has called you to serve Christ in this place? <coughs> I believe that God has called me to serve Christ here. Wayne, will you share your ministry with the people of this benefice? Will you lead, encourage and collaborate with all God's people in building up the body of Christ? With God's <coughs> help, I will. Will you who witness this new beginning support and uphold Wayne in this ministry? We will. We will. Will you share with him in worship and witness, mission and pastoral care? With the help of God, we will. So let us pray for this parish to be committed to his care. <coughs> God our Father, Lord of all the world, we thank you that through your Son you have called us into the fellowship of your universal church. Hear our prayer for all your faithful people that in their vocation and ministry, each may be an instrument of your love. And give to your servant Wayne and all who minister in this place the needful gifts of grace through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And we sit for our first one. or hardship, or persecution, or famine, 
or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
life. Hallelujah. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. <coughs> Out of his good fullness, we have received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. <coughs> Father, your word is a light to our feet, and may we see that light and walk by it tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our culture has got very, very good at naming things that in previous times we just thought were a normal part of everyday experience. And some of that is because uh, psychology has moved on and our insights into the human condition have become much, much more sophisticated. And so things that we thought were just part of a normal human condition, we think, actually, no, there are things that we can do about that to help people to move on from those. But I came across one uh, on the listening to the radio the other day, which I've not come across before. It's called Toxic Positivity. <laughs> now you may laugh, but Toxic Positivity apparently is a thing. And uh, to give you an illustration on this programme, they were particularly uh, mulling over what happened during Covid. So people will put up a post on Covid and say, or put on, on Facebook and say, Actually, if you're young, Facebook's an app that old people like me use. <laughs> uh, they put up a post on Facebook saying, you know, I've got COVID. And they would be given a deluge of positive messages. Oh, you're doing fine. You're doing brilliantly. It's not that bad. You know, things will be absolutely fine. Of course, for quite a few people, that's not how it turned out. And some people are still living with a legacy of it now. I call it sort of, also, you might call it Radio 2 syndrome. It's like, this is the Radio 2. That's full of positivity, I wouldn't call it toxic or not, but it really is. Um, but actually, the thing behind naming it toxic positivity is it has more to do with our inability to cope with the negative feelings of others than it does actually 
providing a genuine encouragement to those who are suffering. Because the danger of it is that you trivialise the deeply held emotions of others. Now, you laughed at toxic positivity at the beginning, but in fact it is a major factor in mental ill health, particularly online. Because online we tend to, you know, if, you, if you're putting up a profile online, frankly, you won't put up uh, something that looks like you've been dragged through a hedge backwards, will you? And the bad things in your life you probably won't put up on, on your social profile, you'll put up all the good things. So we live in this environment, if we're online a lot, where we're basically comparing our inner acts to everybody else's showreel. And we feel guilty that we're not feeling okay. You know, I should and feel like this. I should be able to go back to work. I should well, insert whatever your should is here because of this external pressure. And so you get this double whammy of comparison, both externally and also in your own inner co incoherence. So toxic positivity is the thing. Now in the light of that, I was reading this passage that we had from Romans chapter 8, where Paul said, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Uh, and uh, if you're familiar with sort of Christian positivity, you can go to the Christian bookshop and there are lots of posters with these little verses pulled out of context, often usually with soft focuses of mountains and waterfalls in the background, <laughs> put them around to encourage ourselves. Um, now, I don't think that Romans is toxic positivity. I mean, Paul's letter to the Romans is a theological <coughs> magnum opus. It's a book that literally changed history. It gave birth to the, Re uh, the Reformation. It gave birth to the Evangelical <coughs> Revival. And it has generated an enormous amount of analysis and many, many words. Martin Lloyd Jones, the great uh, preacher, preached his way through Romans with an hour sermon every Sunday for two years in his uh, church in London. I once heard a retired bishop say that they'd uh, uh, heard Martin Lloyd Williams preach on one of Paul's letters. He thought it was the letter T. <laughs> <laughs> but it's easy to forget, it's easy to forget that despite all the extraordinary deep the nuanced theology in Romans, it's primarily a pastoral letter. It's written to a group of new Christians, a very small group. We can tend to forget that you know, these letters in the New Testament are written to very small groups of people. These are not vast populations, vast communities. Maybe it may be measured in the tens, even just maybe just a few hundred people. And they're living in an extraordinarily hostile and dangerous environment. The people to whom Paul wrote, we are more than conquerors of people who'd seen their relations torn to bits by lions for the locals' public entertainment. This was not a group of people who were disappointed that they had to cancel the church fate because it rained. <laughs> these people know what persecution is about. So there were these huge amounts of external pressures on them from the community in which they lived, but there were also internal ones as well. If you are a small minority, where your mode of thinking is completely different from the vast majority of people around you, inevitably it must lead, mustn't it, to a certain insecurity. The Romans, for example, they used to think humility was a vice, not a virtue. They worshipped power. And uh, they were particularly perturbed when these new Christians would go and rescue the babies that they had left on the rubbish tip. They were, they were, they were annoyed by it. They were incredulous that here was a group of people that elevated the lowly. And they caricatured them in all sorts of ways. They regarded them as dangerously subversive because their lifestyle undermined all of the fundamental tenets of the society around them. But for those within that Christian community who, come, who came from a Jewish background, there was also a certain pressure from within their own family, their own self-doubt, because uh, this was not, the ancient world was not a world of um, therapeutic individualism, which is what some sociologists have described our culture 
where it's all about me and the world revolves around me and I make my own decisions and the influence of others in my network of relationships is not that significant. In the time of Jesus and the time Paul is writing this, everyone was in a network of relationships. So to make a decision that you were going to turn your back on the traditions and the culture of your ancestors was a very brave and bold thing to do. You could find yourself very quickly excluded and shunned and kicked out. So this, these poor people that Paul is writing to are people who have both these external pressures and these extraordinary internal ones. They, they have an extraordinary faith. Extraordinary faith to keep going in the face of all this. But no doubt within a certain insecurity and even fear beneath the surface. How, how do you think they would have received these extraordinary words of Paul in Romans 8? Well, I think if they were steeped in the faith, they would have recognised that these words show what is fundamentally Christian, which is the difference between hope and optimism. The difference between hope and toxic positivity. Because actually the Christian faith never promises it will all be fine. It never promises it will all turn out all right in the end. Paul, when he writes to them, is getting to grips with the reality of their experience and speaking to them out of the profound depths of our Christian understanding of God and the way God deals with the world. He reassures them about the security of their identity in Christ. That this is now the one determinant, their relationship with God the Father through Jesus, that gives them a security to face the world, this hostile world, this undermining world, in a way that allows them to endure the most unimaginable suffering and remain faithful. He writes to reassure them that even within this extraordinary place they find themselves, God is working out his will and purpose. And he unveils the very paradox, which is at the heart of the Christian faith, that the very weakness despised by the Romans is in fact the gateway to eternal fruitfulness. Sometimes people ask me, Bishop, what's your strategy? What's your strategy for growing the church? And if I'm feeling slightly mischievous, I say secure an outbreak of widespread persecution. Because <laughs> it seems to work. If you look at the history of the church, places where the church is growing like topsy today tend to be places where persecution is widespread. Well, this is, the, this is the situation of the Christians in Rome. How does this translate into our own con context today? Well, there is no doubt that there is a growing dissonance between the culture and the values of Christian faith and the individualistic culture of our time and of our day. And there is no doubt that there aren't anything like as many of us as there once were. Uh, I was uh, found a biography of one of my predecessors in the, in the office a few weeks ago, and it has a stats page at the back. It's Bishop Attlee, who was the Bishop of Hereford for 26 years at the end of the 19th century. And during the time he was Bishop of Hereford for 26 years, he confirmed 72,000 people. Works out 53 a week. And the uh, biggest confirmation he ever did was in the cathedral with 350. And uh, he, um, he had a technique when he had a lot of, lot of confirmation candidates. I, I, I don't know whether it was in the, in, the, in the palace somewhere. He had a confirmation poll. And presumably this was made of spiritually conducted material. <laughs> so if lots of people wanted to be confirmed, they would grab the pole and presumably the Holy Spirit would pass through the bishop down the pole. <laughs> it was a different world then. You know, when I confirm people today, I mean, I wouldn't want to judge what 72,000 people were doing, but I suspect some of them were doing it because it was the thing that you did. <laughs> Confirmation is not about that. It's about a positive declaration of faith and commitment to Jesus Christ. But if you're in the environment where there's very few of you, and very few of your contemporaries and your friends own the faith for themselves, it, it leads in us sometimes, doesn't it, to a place of security. 
If there's only so few of us, perhaps, perhaps they're all right. And perhaps we're the ones who are wrong. And you might even say, well, if we're passionately committed to this faith being true, which we are, if we're passionately committed to it being a life-changing message, genuinely good news that transforms the soul, transforms the heart, gives meaning, significance, purpose, love, and everything that we need to be human, why is it so difficult to sell it? This is the world that we inhabit. And the pressures on the Romans, you know, fortunately no one's dragging us out to feed us to the lions, but these are the sorts of pressures, the internal pressures that we fear. And of course, leaders are under all sorts of pressure in that environment. You'll discover, Wayne, that they're expecting you to sort it out. <laughs> I came across this the other day, which amused me a lot. This is about the perfect vicar. This is what you were looking for. When you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're about to say they got. <laughs> the, the perfect vicar preaches for exactly ten minutes. Yeah. They condemn sin roundly, but never hurt anyone's feelings. They work from 8 a.m. till midnight, and are also the church caretaker. The perfect vicar makes 100 pounds a week, wears good clothes, drives a good car, buys good books, and donates 30 pounds a week to the church. They are 29 years old and have 40 years experience. <laughs> The perfect vicar has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spends most of their time with senior citizens. <laughs> they smile all the time, but with a straight face because they have a sense of humour that keeps them seriously dedicated to the church. They make 15 home visits a day and are always in their office when needed. The perfect vicar always has time for the PCC and all of its subcommittees. They never miss the meeting of any church organisation and are always busy evangelising the unchurched. If your vicar does not measure up, Simply send this notice to six other churches that are tired of their vicar too. <laughs> then pack up your vicar and send them to the church at the top of the list. If everyone cooperates, in one week you will receive 1,643 vicars. <laughs> one of them should be perfect. Have faith in this letter. One church broke the chain and got its old vicar back. <laughs> Now, well, you might feel a certain internal pressure. <laughs> I don't know. But of course, that's absurd, isn't it? Wayne brings extraordinary gifts to this, uh, to this, um, this role, and we're delighted that he's accepted it. And he will lead you in all sorts of ways, but there will be all sorts of things that he can't do and that you will need to do. And his primary role is not to do everything. It may be to ensure that everything is done. So his role will be a facilitator, and an encourager, and an inspirer. And he's really very, very good at that. I know that. As you from Ludlow will know. I can see you're weeping already. <laughs> <laughs> but this passage reassures us, yes, we are facing extraordinary challenges as a church. There is no doubt about it. There is no denial of that. But Paul is right. That we are more than conquerors through him who has died for us. We are living through the paradox of weakness. That you know weakness makes you more dependent, which makes you more prayerful, which releases the power of God. We are people who in a, a world of individualism seek to, are deeply secure in our identity and our destination. We are secure that God is for us. He has demonstrated that definitively in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this passage also reassures us that Jesus is praying for us. That's his primary role, ascended into heaven, is to pray, to intercede for his body, the church, that he left behind. It's quite good to know that Jesus is praying for us, isn't it? as we go about the tasks he called us to do. And again and again, Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Not famine, not persecution, not the sword, not caricature, not dismissal, not denial, nothing. Because we are followers of Jesus Christ and in the power of his spirit, we are 
to which the historic formularies of the Church of England bear witness, and in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, I will use only the forms of service which are authorised or allowed by canon. I, Wayne Matthew Davis, do swear that I'll be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III, his heirs and their successors, according to the law, so help me God. I, Wayne Matthew Davis, do swear by Almighty God 
that I pray true and conical obedience to the Lord Bishop of Hereford and his successors in all things lawful and honest. So help me God. Richard, by divine permission, Lord Bishop of Hereford, to our beloved in Christ, Wayne Matthew Davis, B.E.M. Clark, greeting. We do hereby institute and admit you as vicar to the benefice of Holmer with Huntingdon within our diocese and jurisdiction of the said Lord Bishop, to which benefice you are presented by the Dean and Chapter of the Cathedral Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Ethelbert in Hereford, the patrons thereof. And we invest you with all rights and duties of the said benefice, and commit to you the cure of souls of the parishioners there, thereof, saving to us and our successors our episcopal rights. In testimony whereof, we have hereunto set our hand, and caused our episcopal seal to be affixed this 15th day of July 2024, and in the year of our translation the 4th, 5th, and of our consecration the 11th. Receive the cure of souls, which is both yours and mine, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who was wounded for our sins, that you may bear in your life and ministry the love and joy and peace, which are the marks of Jesus and his disciples. The Spirit of God rests on you, filling you with wisdom, understanding, and the fear of the Lord. The peace of God stand guard over your heart and mind, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Richard, by divine permission, Lord Bishop of Hereford, to our beloved in Christ, Derek Christopher Chesney, Clark, Archdeacon of Hereford, greeting. We request and direct you to induct the Reverend Wayne Matthew Davis into the real, actual, and corporeal possession of the benefice of Homer with Huntingdon within our diocese and jurisdiction as soon as may be after his institution to the same. In testimony whereof we have hereunto set our hand and caused our Episcopal seal to be affixed this 15th day of July 2024 and in the year of our translation the 5th and of our consecration the 11th.
us, preach the word. Be fervent in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Wayne, we bring the Bible in which our faith is grounded. That together with you, we may baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When we bring this water, the symbol of our rebirth in Christ. That together with you, we may rejoice to bring new Christians to Thank you for sharing these tokens of Christ's ministry in his church through which the Holy Spirit strengthens our communion with the Lord and with one another as we work together for the building up of God's kingdom among us. The Lord preserve your going out and your coming in. From this time forth and forevermore.
yours, Lord, is the greatness, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty for everything in heaven on and earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Amen. Amen. Psalm 46 tells us, be still and know that I am God. So on this very special day, just let's just do that for a minute. <coughs> now let our thoughts and prayers turn to God's church uh, denominations of the world um, and its leaders. Let us thank God for our fellowship in the Universal Church and for our Christian heritage. For those who know, who down the ages have worshipped in our churches and served God by their word and witness. For the clergy, licensed readers and those in local ministry roles who have led worship and provided pastoral care during the vacancy. Let us pray to the Lord. I speak to God. We give thanks for the wider use of time and uh, the wider use of time and talents that we have seen during our interregnum. That these gifts may continue to be used uh, as our church moves forward. Give thanks for the gifts God has given us for our church wardens and church councillors, for all church members in uh, their various callings. And we ask God to guide us so that in all we say and all we do, we may proclaim God's kingdom and build up the body of Christ among us. <coughs> Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. <coughs> Let us give thanks for the community here in this, uh, around this church. We can give thanks for our community of families and ask God to bless every home here for children, young people, and adults. That we may grow together in the faith, the way of faith, that each way I may um, learn the joyful mystery of God's love. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of our community here in Hereford and those who help sustain our lives day by day. <coughs> we give thanks for these, uh, those people in our local community who serve our needs, for those who bear responsibility in government, for all who work in education and our local schools, for those in farming, commerce and industry, and for those who work here, praying that, uh, that guided by God, we may act justly, honour one another, and seek the common good. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who are suffering at this time, and for those who minister uh, to them. We give thanks for all who minister to those who are in trouble. We pray for all in distress, for sick and suffering, those who mourn and those who are without hope, asking God um, for their comfort and restoration. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, hear our prayer. Again, gracious Father, strengthen us to carry forward the work of Christ. That we, the Lord, who confess your name, may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory before the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name.
Um, well, I'd say this might be brief, but it may not. Uh, I asked Erin, not Erin, sorry, Jane today, just for a, a sort of list of names of people who've stepped into the gap in this interregnum. And uh, she sent me something like a toilet roll. <laughs> and uh, there's loads of people on here. So, Erin, thank you just for taking the charge on this, of uh, leading this church beautifully. Mary yourself as well, for the church wardens and for the parish wardens that we've got. And all those people, you know who you are, who supported and stood in the gap while you've been in the gap. Um, and for Janice and Jared, it's their fault. Okay, they're the guys that interviewed me. All right, so there's no portion might come in my way. If you're upset, they're the first people to go to. All right. Um, thank you. And thank you for your hospitality, for our family, for the gifts we received in the house, for that aerial dryer. It's the best aerial dryer I've ever seen. It is amazing. It's wonderful. I love with my little peg bag on. If you go and see me in the morning, and my little peg bag on, get my pegs out, peg out, washing out. It's wonderful. Um, <coughs> Kelvin and I have journeyed together over the last 15 years as in friends, but also as in a relationship of working together over the last seven. And we often sit and reflect and joke of where we've come from and where God has brought us to. And if you'd have known my story 20 years ago, this is not the same way that stands before you. And if you know the story from about 14 years ago when I'm stood in the shower and God says, Wayne, you need to become a vicar, and I laugh so hard, we won't talk about the rest. <laughs> and then thinking, the only vicar I know is this man here. And he tells me about this whole process you have to go through. And I go, nah, I must have heard God wrong. And then took about a seven-year detour of thinking, I know best. To be stood before you as your new vicar, to learn to love you and walk alongside you and you walk alongside us as a family, it's just mind-blowing, I'm telling you. <laughs> My brain is doing all manner of things at the minute. But just, look, just a couple of quick thank yous. Sarah, children, thank you, kids, even though they mock me when I'm, you don't see the mocking when I'm up here and they're down there going... Um, <laughs> But thank, thank you, just thank you for Sarah just being an amazing support, the rock, wisdom, grace, beauty, love, all those sort of things that keep me grounded and on the straight and narrow. Peace. <laughs> you know, for our children, this is their 14th move. And as the bell tolled, hopefully this is <laughs> maybe the last one for a while. But thank you, thanks guys, just for sort of coming on this crazy journey with us and just being awesome as you always are. Kelvin, thanks for just being a great boss. You've been awesome. You've just been a great friend, a great encourager. You've kept me on the straight and narrow as well. He's uh, pointed me in the right direction. And uh, I've upset him loads of times and just thrown loads of curveballs at him and he's rolled with it. So, church, just know <laughs> that you're going to get some curveballs. You think you're going one way and I might just throw one in and we'll start spinning in a different direction. But hey, Christ is in control of everything. He knows exactly what he's doing and I don't. So as long as you're aware of that, will all be okay. And finally, all those friends that have supported me, you know who you are, Lizzie, listening to my ramblings over uh, theological debates and things like that. If I had hair, I would have torn it out. And all those that have journeyed, Leah and Chris and all at the back and all you in Ludlow, St John's and St Lawrence's, thank you. You've been amazing. You're such beautiful friends. And I'll be here this Sunday, strangely, uh, at 11 for common worship. Yeah. Go figure. But also, I'll be at Huntington if you want to go and do BCP, Holy Communion at 9.30. That's it. Thanks. I don't give notices out of 10, but actually that's quite a good one. <laughs> For those of you who haven't been to a licensing service, like you're never going to a licensing service. <laughs> but those of you who haven't been to a licensing service, just to say, it is odd, I know, to be welcomed by the bishop and then shown the door by the archdeacon. But that's the way we do things. <laughs> and I echo my thanks for all the work at school. Let's stand as we ask for God's blessing. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who has made heaven and earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now and forever. Amen. Almighty
Almighty God, who for the salvation of the world gives to his people many gifts and ministries to the advancement of his glory, stir up in you the gifts of his grace, sustain each one of you in your own ministry, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.